because in the scripture reading I read this morning is uh, Daniel chapter 9, and uh, <clears throat> we'll start in verse 20 of Daniel chapter 9. This chapter is a chapter that uh, has a rich meaning to our congregation here, and uh, one which you will be familiar with, I'm sure. But notice what verse 20 says, And while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sins of my people, what was Daniel doing? He was praying and repenting, praying and confessing. Daniel was a man of prayer, and so have God's people ever been, then till now. And that's the good news, isn't it? That we need to be men and women of prayer. And while he was praying, requesting the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me swift, in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. So where did this uh, explanation come from? It didn't come from Daniel, it came from Gabriel, who brought it from the throne room of God. He was instructed by God to bring this understanding and this insight to Daniel. And verse 23, as soon as you began to pray, an answer was given. Isn't that the good news, friends? As soon as you begin to pray, God has an answer already. Now, you may not hear it, you may not see it, but God has the answer. Isn't that encouraging? As soon as you began to pray, the answer was giving, given, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed, therefore consider the message and understand the vision. Seventy sevens, or seventy weeks of sevens, are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for the wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know and understand that from the beginning of this decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. This is the most fascinating prophecy, the mystery man of Bible prophecy. Every day in Jerusalem, <clears throat> uh, the Jewish people go down to the Western Wall praying for the coming of the Messiah. Earnestly and with deep respect, they rock their bodies backwards and forwards, humbly pleading to their God. The people of Israel hope and pray that soon... My little magic stick's not working. Well, I suppose that will make some difference, won't it, if it is? Oh, maybe the green says it's on and the red says it's off. <laughs> there it is. Thank you very much. Michael's touch did the trick. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> okay, the people of Israel pray that the soon Messiah will come and return their treasured temple to its former glory. The political and spiritual hope of the Jew is for a Messiah who will bring freedom to the people of Israel and, to, and peace to the world. Throughout the last 2,000 years, there were many Messiah hopefuls. Simon bar -Koda, in 135 AD, Moses of Crete, 450 AD, Serene, 720 AD, David Aluri, 1160 AD, Abraham Abelufa, 1240 AD, Shabbati Savai, 1626 AD, and more recently, Rabbi 
Sneeson, a New York-based rabbi who created much excitement until he died. These have all been hopeful messiahs, but they've all proved to be false. Where is the Messiah? Why has he taken so long? What has happened to all the promises of the Jews? When will this mystery man of prophecy finally arrive? In what may be the greatest of all prophecies, the ancient prophet Daniel predicted important events in history of the Jews. This included the exact date for the coming of the Messiah. In 539 BC, Jerusalem lay in ruins. The prophet Daniel predicted that Jerusalem would be rebuilt. He also predicted the specific year for the coming of the Messiah. And further, that the Messiah would die. That the unique purpose of the Messiah's death and the, specific, and the specific year for the death of the Messiah, a cut-off date for the Jewish people as a chosen race, and the city of Jerusalem would again be destroyed. Clearly, this prophecy has major ramifications for the Jews. Do the Jews know about this prophecy? What do they think about it? Should their search for the Messiah be over? In a bizarre twist, not only is this prophecy known to the Jewish scholars, but the rabbinical curse has been placed on any Jew who reads it to discover the timing and the coming of the Messiah. One Jewish sage said, May the spirits of those who attempt to calculate the final time of Messiah's coming expire. This is uh, Sanhedrin 97b, quoted in chapter 12 of Hilko's Malchim from the Mishab Torah of Rabban. With that warning in mind, let us investigate one of the most intriguing prophecies in ancient scriptures. Please read the full chapter of Daniel 9 and more specifically verses 24 to 27. We have read some of those verses already this morning. What did Jesus say was the theme of the Old Testament scriptures? If we come to Luke chapter 24, verse 27, we'll notice this passage. And beginning at Moses, remember he was talking to the two men on the road to Emmaus. And they were confused about what had just happened in Jerusalem. And Jesus joins them and he says to them, beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning... You see the little blue word there? That's when you're supposed to say... When you read it out, you're supposed to say it, okay? So I'll give you the clue. <laughs> okay, I'll go back. Um, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning... Thank you, you're a good class. Both the Old and the New Testament scriptures have Jesus Christ as the, as the central theme. The New Testament writers highly highlight Jesus as the fulfilment of the Old Testament prophecies more than 130 times. Some scholars have estimated that the Old Testament contains over 300 specific prophecies describing who the Messiah is and what he will do. At the very least, more than 50 major prophecies can clearly be identified and tested against the prospective Messiah. What would be the chance of all 50 prophecies being fulfilled in one person? Astronomer and mathematician Peter Stoner, Stoner calculated that the chances of fulfilling just eight of these prophecies is one in 100,000 million. Did I say million? I should have said trillion. The chances of fulfilling nearly 50% of them 
would be one in one followed by 150 zeros, 157 zeros. By comparing the life of Jesus with the predictions from the Old Testament, it is clear that Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled all the messianic prophecies. This study guide demonstrates the evidence from just a few of these prophetic messages. How then do we know Jesus was a historical character? Besides the Bible, there are independent historical sources which verify the existence of Jesus Christ. At least 17 non-Christian sources mention Jesus all within 150 years of his life. These include Roman historians, Greek writers, Jewish religious leaders and Jewish historians. The Jewish historian Flavius Josephus in AD 37 wrote, Now there were about this time Jesus, a wise man. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day. As the divine prophets had foretold, these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct to this day. That's what I just read. Question three. In what city did the prophetic scriptures predict Jesus would be born? Come to Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, uh, which says, But you... Let's all say it together. But you... Bethlehem. Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. Several hundred years before the birth of Christ, the prophet Micah knew the birthplace of the Messiah. There were two Bethlehems in the days of Jesus, one in the north of Palestine and the other uh, Ephrata, a small town in Judea. The prophecy is specific. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. The New Testament writers recorded the history of this birthplace exactly as the Bible predicted it in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Although Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he did not originate from there. According to the prophet Micah, Jesus is from everlasting. In other words, prior to the coming to earth, he never had a beginning. That is part of the mystery of God. Jesus was not just a prophet or just a good man. He was God. Was there a specific time when Jesus would appear and die for his people? Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son. And in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. One of the key aspects of the messianic prophecies revolves around time. Jesus came to this earth in the fullness of time and died in due time. He himself knew the prophecies and on more than one occasion he avoided conflict with the Jews because his hour had not yet come. Now let's come to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. Jerusalem had been captured by Babylon, the superpower of the day, and Daniel was taken as a prisoner of war. And while in captivity, Daniel received visions from God outlining global empires that would succeed the might of Babylon. You know that prophecy so well. We find it in Daniel. 
What chapter? You're a good Bible class. I know you can respond to me. In what chapter of Daniel do we find the vision outlining all the future empires of the world? The head of gold, the arms and breasts of silver, the thighs of brass, the legs of iron. Remember that vision? That is found in Daniel chapter? Daniel chapter 2. Daniel saw nations such as Medo-Persia, the Greeks, and then another empire, the Romans, ruling over the Jews. He literally became sick with anxiety in Daniel chapter 8, verse 27. Where was the Messiah? And who would bring from persecution and hatred? Why weren't the Jews ruling the world? As Daniel realised the gravity of the situation, he prayed earnestly for his city and his people. He knew the Jews had rebelled against God on many occasions and now he was concerned that they may have gone too far. God answered Daniel's prayer by sending down the angel Gabriel with a prophecy that we find documented in Daniel chapter 9, which we read those verses earlier this morning. What was the identified time period allocated to the Jewish people? In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, we read, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting uh, righteousness, to seal up the vision of the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. This prophecy deals specifically with the future of the Jews. We know this because the because Gabriel pinpoints to Daniel your people and your holy city. At the start of this prophecy, Daniel is given a time code. The Jewish people would have 70 weeks or 490 days to make an end of sin, to bring in everlasting righteousness. This meant God would give the Jews another opportunity to stop their false worship and become a holy nation. So fact number one, the Jews were given 70 weeks or 490 days to what? Repent. In prophetic symbolism, what does a day represent? In Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse uh, 6, we read, as God foretold the future in Ezekiel's day, I have laid on you a day for each year. In Bible prophecy, a day represents a literal year. This principle found in the prophetic book of Ezekiel is also found throughout the Bible in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34. This approach was followed by Jewish scholars prior to Jesus Christ and is still followed today. The day for a year principle is also the only possible answer to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. It would be impossible for all the events of Daniel 9 to apply to a literal 490 days. Jerusalem was not even rebuilt by then. As a result, the 490 day time period allocated to the Jews represents a literal 490 years. Clearly, God is a very patient God. What do you say? Fact number two. The 70 weeks or 490 days represents 490 literal years. What was the starting point for this time period for the Jews? Now, this is a very interesting question and one which... Um, those who would oppose our understanding of the prophecy have debated over the years. This, this has been something that has been fiercely debated. Because when the Jews were taken captive by the Babylonians, there came a time when Babylon itself was captured. Do you remember? How did Babylon fall? Who was surrounding the city of Babylon? the Medes and the Persians. And the Persians and the Medes built a 
alternative channel for the river Euphrates that flowed through the middle of the city. And uh, while they were having a drunken party inside with Belteshazzar, um, Cyrus and Darius and their armies were marching under the city wall in through the brass gates which controlled the water flow into the city because the brass gates had been left open and that was prophesied by a prophet some hundreds of years before and the city fell that night. So the Medes and the Persians uh, conquered the Babylonians. Now it came to them to see the wisdom of the Jews returning to Jerusalem. And we read about three different decrees in Ezra. First of all, the Cyrus's decree in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, and chapter 6 is verses 3 to 5. Cyrus issued the decree for the Jews to return to Jerusalem. Then there was a second decree of Darius in Ezra chapter 6, verses 1 to 12. Again, the Jews were encouraged to return to Jerusalem. But, you know, after 70 years of captivity, uh, they had established their little businesses and they had established uh, a lifestyle that they had got used to in captivity in Babylon. And so many of the Jews did not return. Some did. And when they returned, what did they find? A broken-down city. And as they tried to do any repairs or any reconstruction, who opposed them? The locals. Who were the locals? <laughs> the Arab nations didn't want to see the Jews returning to Jerusalem. And so we come to the third decree, which is Artaxerxes' decree in Ezra chapter 7. And this decree is the one that uh, is one that fascinates us in our understanding of Bible prophecy because it's this decree where Artaxerxes uh, decrees that uh, the Jewish people uh, were to um, establish Jerusalem as a judicial and civil centre. Civil control included the right to rebuild public works. And furthermore, Artaxerxes opened his bank account and gave them the funds by which to do it. Now this decree is something very different to the other two decrees. And so if you have a starting point that is the wrong date, then of course you'll have a finishing date that's not correct. All right, let's have a look then and see uh, what was the starting point for this time period for the Jews. In Daniel chapter 9... And verse uh, 25, you've still got your Bibles open there in Daniel chapter 9. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the decree or the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, 62 weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall and even in troublous times even though Artaxerxes had given them the facilities to rebuild the city and the judicial control for doing that, the surrounding Arab nations really gave them a hard time in the reconstruction of the city. And you'll notice that... Uh, that the rebuilding of Jerusalem took some 49 years. It was a mammoth task. But there it is. Seven weeks, and from 457 BC to 408 BC, uh, that was the time period that the Jews took to rebuild the city. The starting point of 457. Oh, what am I doing? The starting point of 457 was the command allowing the Jews to return to Jerusalem and build their city. This decree is found in Ezra 7, was made by King Artaxerxes in the seventh year of his reign, uh, or in 457 BC. 457 BC uh, is verified in history through the writings of the Greek historian Herodotus, um, through the Babylonian records and through the Alexandrian astronomer Ptolemy the canon of Ptolemy. So Isaac Newton, um, one of the greatest scientists ever, 
documented this starting date as among the most easily established dates in history. And yet there's been such a lot of discussion over this date of 457 that even some of our fellow Adventists question it. Well, um, let's proceed as we go through this and see how uh, our understanding whether it's correct or not. Uh, the Messiah, fact number three, Jerusalem would be rebuilt and the starting date for the prophecy is 457 BC. All right, question number eight. What then would happen at the end of the first 69 weeks? Until the Messiah, the Prince. Daniel was told that the Messiah would come 69 weeks after the command to rebuild Jerusalem. Uh, if that command was made in 457, then 69 weeks, or 483 literal years, brings us to the date of AD 27. You need to remember there's no year zero. And when you're crossing the date line, you need to add, another, you need to add a one to the numbers. According to this prophecy, the Messiah would arrive in AD 27. Did he? What happened in AD 27? This is one of the most exciting aspects of this prophecy. The Messiah means the anointed ones. Up until AD 27, Jesus was a tradesman working each day as a carpenter in a carpenter's shop. In AD 27, his life completely changed. Jesus was baptised in the Jordan River and anointed by the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. He left his job as a tradesman and began his public ministry as the Messiah for the Jews. The date of Jesus' baptism, AD 27, is determined by a comparison of the biblical account and Roman historical records. In Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, says that uh, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the word of God came to John. And he went into all the region around Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance. Now we have uh, a date given here when John was baptizing and when Jesus went to John to be baptized. What, what year was it? It was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. And when was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius? AD 27. Wonders of wonders. So fact number six, the Messiah would be killed. What would the Messiah do in the middle of the last week of the prophecy? Come to Daniel chapter 9. Somehow <clears throat> we've got out of sync here. After the 62 weeks, the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself, in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. And in the middle of the week, he would be killed. So fact number six, the Messiah would be killed. What would then, what would the Messiah do in the middle of the last week of this prophecy? In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering, Daniel 9, 27. In the middle of this last week, um, <clears throat> being half of the uh, last seven years, is three and a half years after the coming of the Messiah in AD 27. That would bring us to the year AD 31, right on time according to the Bible prophecy. When Jesus died, the curtain in the temple was miraculously ripped from the top to the bottom. 
This symbol, this symbolized the end to animal sacrifices exactly as the Bible had predicted in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. In the temple service, the Passover lamb was sacrificed once a year on a special day and at a specific time, the afternoon of the 14th day of the Hebrew month, Nisan. As the priests were preparing to kill the Passover lamb, Jesus was dying on a lonely cross. On that dark afternoon, the prophecy fulfilled as Christ our Passover was sacrificed, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. This historical time is verified by the Jewish books such as Talmud, notice of this statement referring to Jesus, Yeshu in Hebrew, being hanged on a tree. On the eve of the Passover, that's the afternoon, they hanged Yeshu of Nazareth, but they found naught in his defence and hanged him on the eve of the Passover. This is recorded in the Babylonian Sanhedrin 43a. By decoding the temple service of the Passover along with the amazing time prophecies of Daniel 9, we can see that Jesus Christ died on the very year, month and week and day predicted hundreds of years before it ever took place. This time prophecy demonstrates that the Bible can be trusted and Jesus Christ is the true Messiah of prophecy. Fact number seven. The Messiah is Jesus Christ who would die in AD 31. To whom did Jesus tell his disciples to first preach? In Matthew chapter 10 verses 5 and 6, do not go the way of the Gentiles and do not enter into the city of the Samaritans but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And after being anointed the Messiah in AD 27, Jesus knew the Jewish nation had only had seven years left to repent and accept him as their Messiah. And the saviour from sin, Jesus instructed his disciples to focus on preaching to the Jewish people. He longed for the Jews. He longed for the Jewish nation to accept him and, pre and present him as the Messiah to the whole world. Even after his death, Jesus told his disciples to begin their ministry at Jerusalem. He had not given up on the people of Jerusalem. There was still time if they would accept Jesus, the resurrected Messiah. Doesn't that demonstrate a God of patience? Even after they had slain his son, Jesus instructed his disciples to work with the Jewish people in Jerusalem. <clears throat> what warning did Jesus give to the people of Israel? Come Matthew chapter 21 and verse 43. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a, a nation bearing the truths of it. Jesus loved the people of Jerusalem. Jesus himself was a Jew. He wept over the city. He pleaded with the religious leaders to believe in him and have a heart experience with God. He performed miracles, taught spiritual truths, he healed the sick. Jesus did everything to help the Jewish people become a holy nation. Jesus knew the prophecies of Daniel 9 and he passionately warned them about refusing to accept the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus declared that the great promise of a glorious future would be taken away from the Jews and given to another people. When did the gospel really begin to go to the Gentiles? In Acts chapter 7 and verse 59 and chapter 8 verses 1 to 4, and devout men <coughs> carried Stephen to his burial. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, <clears throat> went everywhere preaching the gospel. So what was the turning point? The turning point was the stoning of Stephen in AD 34. When Stephen was killed by the Jewish religious leaders, he became the first Christian martyr. 
This occurred in 34 AD, exactly 490 years after the start of the prophecy. This was the end of the Jewish nation when God saw what the Jewish leaders did to the leadership of his emerging church, he must have said in his heart, enough is enough. Go now and preach the gospel to the Gentiles because the Jewish nation hardened themselves against the long-suffering love of God. The prophecy now was over. Fact number eight. The Jewish probation as God's holy nation ended when? In AD 34. And this is a very important uh, fact to remember because there are a lot of people in our world today who are looking towards Jerusalem being restored. Have you heard it? There are a lot of Christians who believe that uh, Jesus will return to Jerusalem and the Jewish kingdom will be established as the headquarters for the world church, for the whole world. But in AD 34, this was the end of God's dealing with the Jewish nation as a nation of his instrument in reaching people of the world. A very interesting prophecy. Starts in 457 BC. 49 years later, Jerusalem is rebuilt. 434 years later, in AD 27, Jesus is anointed as the Messiah at his baptism. Three and a half years of public ministry, Jesus is crucified on a cruel cross. And then three and a half years later, they still had the chance to turn in repentance. God is long-suffering and patient with his people. And in AD 34, with the stoning of Stephen, God indicated this was the end of his dealings with the Jews as a nation. What would happen to Jerusalem after the death of the Messiah? Come to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that's exactly what happened. Remember the Roman soldiers surrounded the city? Jesus had said to his disciples, when you see uh, the, the soldiers surrounding the city come down from the rooftop and flee to a little place outside of Jerusalem, how did the Christians escape out of the city? Well, it's an interesting thing in history that the Roman army heard of another uh, battle that was uh, another skirmish that was taking place and so the soldiers withdrew from the city and they went to settle this other issue. And uh, with the soldiers gone from the city, the Christians had uh, time to flee to a little place called Pella, about some eight miles uh, outside of the city of Jerusalem. And the uh, historians record that not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. The soldiers returned to capture the city of Jerusalem and uh, they were so uh, infuriated by the stubborn resistance of the Jews that uh, when they saw the, the temple glistening with gold as it was, uh, they put fire to the temple uh, and gold literally ran like water. And Jesus said to his disciples, the day is coming when there'll be not one stone left upon another. And that's exactly what happened to the city because the soldiers were keen to be getting the gold and the gold went down through all the, the building materials of the city. Here we are told that sometime after the death of Jesus, the city of, and the sanctuary would be destroyed. This occurred in AD 70. When the Roman armies marched on Jerusalem and burnt it to the ground, the city and its temple were destroyed to such an extent that any remaining Jews were scattered to all parts of the then known world. Fact number nine, the city and the temple of Jerusalem would be destroyed again. 
According to the scriptures, who are God's chosen people today? Come with me to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's descendants, Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. The Bible says that if you belong to Jesus, then you have access to all the promises that were made to Abraham and his people. The Jews have not been abandoned or cursed. As individuals, every Jew who accepts Jesus Christ as the Messiah and the Lord also has total access to the promises of God. But now we find it is the church, it is the church of Jesus who are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation and his own people. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Fact number 10, the Christian church is now spiritual Israel. Messiah revealed. These are the facts that we've looked at today. The Jews were given 70 weeks, 490 days to repent. 70 weeks or 490 literal years. Jerusalem would be rebuilt. The starting date for the prophecy is 457. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, came right on time in AD 27. Jesus recognised the time and he became the Messiah. The Messiah would be killed. The Messiah is Jesus Christ who would die in AD 31. The Jews' probation as God's only chosen people ended in AD 34. The city and the temple of Jerusalem would be destroyed again. The Christian church is now spiritual Israel. Three points to remember. Jesus Christ is the theme of the entire Bible. Number two, Jesus Christ is the Messiah for the Jews and the saviour of all mankind. And if you have accepted Jesus, you belong to God's true people, spiritual Israel. A young lady by the name of Tabitha wore a gold locket around her neck. Tabitha's friend often talked about this locket and wondered who was the love of her life. Who might it be? Tabitha would never open the locket, but her friend could tell how precious the picture of her lover must be. Tabitha would hold this locket in her hands and treasure it close to her heart. When Tabitha died unmarried and at a fairly young age, her friends opened the locket and inside they found a simple crumpled up note that said, Him who I have never seen, I love. What are some of the reflections that you have today in the context of this amazing Bible prophecy? I challenge us all to think in terms of such a wonderful God who loves us. And though we may not have seen him, that we cherish that love relationship with him and thank him for such a wonderful Messiah that we have in the person Jesus Christ, the mystery man of Bible prophecy.